Well, good morning. It's good to be with you on this uh, first Lord's Day uh, of September, and uh, we are uh, pre-recording this service, and that's why things look a little bit differently. Uh, I'm a little more up close than I normally am, and uh, that is because our church is uh, meeting out at our Windcrest Bible Camp facility for an outdoor uh, day of worship and fellowship and communion, and uh, we so wish each and every one of you were there. Uh, maybe you don't live in St. John and you can't be there, or maybe you are a part of the church family and uh, you just can't make it out to the camp facility for whatever reason and uh, wanted to still have an opportunity to spend some time with you and to encourage you in the Lord on this day, and uh, I'm so thankful for the technology that enables us to be able to do this. And thankful for Josh being here uh, with me to run things uh, that way. And my wife is here as well to help with the music. And again, just wanted to have this opportunity to be able to be an encouragement uh, to you in your walk with the Lord. And uh, even though you can't be physically with our church family out at Windcrest today. I won't take any time to make any announcements uh, at the end of the time um, that we have here together. Uh, we'll be running our uh, several slides that are... Um, indicating things that are coming up in the month of September and in October as far as our church uh, calendar is concerned. And so if you would like to be uh, say on a little bit afterwards to catch those announcements, you can feel free to do so. If that doesn't interest you, again, maybe you're not in St. John, uh, there's no need for you to uh, track with that afterwards, but uh, that will be available at the end. And so we're just going to go ahead and take a moment to pray and ask God to bless this time that we have. And uh, then we'll begin uh, with a couple of songs and scripture readings and then a message here in just a bit. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to uh, seek your face on this uh, Lord's Day. Uh, you have been so abundantly kind and good to us uh, to preserve us, uh, both physically and spiritually. And I'm so thankful that we have the opportunity, uh, even when we can't um, physically be together, as is the case with uh, those who are joining today, uh, that there is still an opportunity to be able to just be encouraged in the Lord. And I pray that that will happen, Lord, that you would just uh, really uh, give us a clear sense of your presence here with us. Uh, we know that you are with us because the Lord Jesus Christ has uh, given his life that we might be reconciled to you and uh, that we can enjoy the fullness of your presence uh, because of the Holy Spirit that indwells us. And I just pray that each and every one who are joining on this Lord's Day would just uh, sense the presence of the Holy Spirit if there happened to be uh, someone joining even today that uh, does not have that certainty of eternal life, that I pray that the Word would just uh, bring that about uh, in them uh, even today. And uh, Lord, we just desire to bring honor to your name in everything that is said and done during this time. And so I do pray that you'll tune our hearts to sing your praise and to tune our minds to just engage with your Word. Help me to be clear as I proclaim it, and I pray that we would all... Uh, be encouraged in the Lord as a result of this time together. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I wanted to uh, just share at the onset the scripture that is uh, so special uh, from Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 that tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't have to tell any one of you that the world is very much shifting and changing and uh, in most of the ways in which it's changing, it is not for the better. And uh, we're troubled by these things. We're affected by these things. And yet we find a refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that he never changes. And that the promises that are made to us, we can bank on them uh, any time. Whatever circumstances are taking place in our own lives or whatever circumstances are going on in the world we know that Jesus Christ is the same. And so I invite you to sing a song with me here uh, that just expresses our confidence in the unchangeableness of Christ. The song, Yesterday, Today, and Forever. And the verses that we're going to sing speak specifically to the text that we'll be looking at uh, where the disciples are, are put out in a storm and they are fearful uh, for their lives and yet Jesus comes to them and he speaks to them in the storm and these, this song really speaks to that, even talks about the very narrative that we'll be looking at in this song. And so I'd invite you to sing a couple of verses with, this, with me, this song, Yesterday, Today, and Forever. <clears throat> How sweet the glorious message simple faith may claim. 
Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. Still he loves to save the sinful, heal the sick and lame. Cheer the mourner, calm the tempest, glory to his name. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. our wildest tempest as on Galilee. He who wept and prayed in anguish in Gethsemane drinks with us each cup of trembling in our agony. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. Change, but Jesus never glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus never glory to his name. What a great song that is. And uh, such comforting truth uh, to know that uh, Christ is the same. And I want to uh, turn uh, to Psalm 46 uh, for a moment with you just as a scripture reading. Of course, Jesus is God, and uh, he is God in the flesh. And uh, Psalm 46 speaks of the nature of God, uh, which of course is the nature of Jesus, that God never changes, that he's an ever-present help in time of trouble, and that he is always there for us, and that even in difficult and very tumultuous times, that we can rest in him and we can be still and just know that he is God and that he is on the throne. And Psalm 46 is such a special psalm that communicates that, and I trust that this will be an encouragement as we read this together. Uh, Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the ends of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. What a comfort in that psalm uh, to know, again, that even though all of this noise that's going on, wars and all of these other things that this psalm talks about, yet God is in all of those things. He is sovereign over all of those things. And God's people take refuge as they find solace in his providence and in his love and in his care. And yet, at the same time, we know that all of this noise is going to end someday, that the best is going to come, and that there will be a kingdom of peace and righteousness on this earth. And we as believers have confidence that we will be a part of that kingdom. What a great truth in that Psalm. Why don't we sing another song together? And again, I'd urge you just to sing right along with me in your homes the song, Be Still My Soul, which is just adapted from that very psalm that we just read, Psalm 46 and verse 10. 
reminding us that no matter what we're going through, we can still be quiet and be still because our God is the same. Be still, my soul. We'll sing all three verses. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on my side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy assurance and that words of that song I trust that that is a help to you I'd invite you if you have a copy of the Bible nearby there uh, to turn to the book of John in chapter 6 this morning John chapter 6 the story is told of a lake somewhere in England where people can go and rent a boat for a certain period of time and paddle around And the boats are all numbered, one, all the way up to 20. And the way the owner of the boats announces to people that their time was up was through this megaphone. Boat number one, your time is up. Boat number 13, it's time to dock. Well, on one particular evening, it was well past the time of closing. It was getting dark, and it was becoming dangerous to be out on the lake. And sometime after closing... All the boats were in except for one. And the man on the shore could no longer see at all, but he kept on calling through the megaphone, boat number six, come in. Boat number six, your time is well past, come in. But boat number six never came in. And the man finally, in frustration, called out, boat number nine, do you need rescue? Now, some of you will need some time to get the point of that joke, but maybe you have felt like you were on a boat that was capsized at some point in your life, and no one could see your peril, 
no one could see your struggle and could come to help you, and maybe they couldn't even care less anyway. Have you ever just sensed that if God did not intervene into your situation soon that you wouldn't be able to take it anymore? Well, if you have ever experienced that kind of discouragement and hopelessness, and we all have, you will be able to identify with the disciples as we find them in John chapter 6 and verse 16. A very short passage this morning, but let me read for you John 6 verse 16 and down to 21. It says, and when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea. And they entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark. And Jesus was not come yet to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five or twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he said unto them, it is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at land whither they went. Would you pray with me a moment? Our gracious God, as we look at your word, that we recognize that we are needy, and we need you to speak to us. We pray that you will help the word to just be opened before us in a way that we can understand and apply I pray, God, that you would build faith in us through your word, that your spirit would be near to us, helping us to understand and just knowing how to make this uh, text really apply to our current situation. Lord, you know all the needs, you know all the people that are joining and bear from various places, and I just pray that you will sovereignly work so that your word will touch each and every life that is in, in being exposed to it here this morning. And I just pray that you will conform us to the image of Christ and build our faith as a result of this time in the Word together. We would thank you and give you glory if you would accomplish that in our lives. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible in front of you this morning, you can scan a little bit earlier in John chapter 6 and see that the account that we just read is about Jesus calming this storm that had enveloped the disciples comes right on the account, on the heels of the account of this miraculous feeding of 5,000 men. That miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 is one of two miracles that is recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can find a parallel accounts in John of, that we, to what we find here in John 6. You can find it in Matthew 14. You can find it in Mark 6 and in Luke 9. You wonder what the other miracle is that is recorded in all four Gospels. Well, the other miracle that is found in all four books is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we understand that the feeding of the 5,000 is an extremely important miracle and that it's recorded by all four of the Gospel writers. Its importance is highlighted by the fact that Jesus exerts much effort to explain its meaning and its importance. In fact, if you look beyond the passage we just read to the end of Luke, or John chapter 6, the bulk of this chapter is actually Jesus expositing what he did and what he was communicating in the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. And he communicates and presents himself as the bread of life. And he explains what that means in a very lengthy section beyond the passage that we're looking at here this morning. And just wedged between the, the feeding of the 5,000, this amazing miracle that is recorded by all four gospel writers and this message that Jesus teaches about that feeding of the 5,000 is this tiny little account, this little private miracle that Jesus performs just for his disciples out in the middle of the sea. John includes it, this story in its briefest form here in John 6. However, we do read about it in Matthew 14 and in Mark 6. Now, for some reason, Luke doesn't include the story in his gospel. But when you take Matthew's account, Mark's account, and then you take John's account here, you can put these all together and weave them and realize the full picture of what actually took place. And I'm not going to have you turn to Matthew and Mark, but I will allude to both of those other passages throughout our going through of this passage so that we can get all of the understanding of what's actually going on. 
Let's begin here in verse 16. Again, I'll read verse 16 and 17 when it says, And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. Now, prior to this event, the previous day, Jesus and the disciples had been on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, or as it became known, the Sea of Tiberias. Most of the Jewish population around the sea was there on that western side of the sea. Capernaum, as we read it here in verse 17, was on that west side, sort of in the northwest corner of the sea. And Jesus and the disciples had been there before this day, and they had worn themselves out in ministry on that side of the sea. And earlier that day, Jesus had landed with his disciples on the eastern shore of the lake where there were fewer people. They had gone there to try to get away from the hordes of people that were flocking to them to have Jesus heal their sick. And Jesus spent some time in seclusion with his disciples in the mountain there. That's actually recorded back in verse 3 of John 6. But the crowd from the western side eventually caught up to them. And Jesus, moved with compassion, received the crowd and met their needs. And as the day wore on, he observed that the people were hungry. And so he multiplied those five barley loaves and two fishes that the boy had brought to him, and he fed 5,000 men along with women and children. And the fallout from that miracle was that those men who had just had their bellies filled by this food desired to take Jesus by force and make him their king. And Jesus, knowing their intent, we read in verse 15 that he withdrew from them and ascended up into the mountain. But verse 16, he didn't take his disciples with him into this mountain. He went to be alone with the Father. And the disciples descended from the grassy field where Jesus had fed the multitude, and they went back to the sea. And this is extremely important to note. There is a separation that takes place between Jesus on the mountain and his disciples down on the shore. He goes up, they go down. He's spending time in fellowship with the Father, and they are rowing. And the critical detail that Matthew and Mark add for us is that Jesus actually commanded them to go down to the sea and to do that. In fact, Matthew 14 and verse 22, it says, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him onto the other side, that is to Capernaum. In other words, Jesus deliberately sent his disciples all alone onto that body of water. And what do we read here in verse 16? Again, that his disciples went down into the sea, they entered into a ship, and they went over the sea toward Capernaum. They obeyed what Jesus commanded them to do. They did exactly what Jesus said when Jesus said it by getting into the boat that evening. And lesson number one that I want to, for all of us to see from this story is that sometimes Jesus sends his followers into a storm. Sometimes Jesus sends his followers into a storm. Do you suppose Jesus knew that a storm was coming that night? Do you suppose he could have prevented the storm from coming that night? Do you suppose that he could have made sure that he was on the boat with them to make sure that they landed safely on the other side without experiencing any danger? And yet, he sent them out alone. This was not the disciples' idea. Now, sometimes the disciples had bad ideas. We read about their bad ideas in other places, Sometimes we get bad ideas ourselves, and we get ourselves into messy situations. But in this case, the disciples were simply doing what Jesus told them to do. And usually when Jesus told them to do things, they worked out really well. For instance, when Jesus had just said the day before, bring the boys lunch to me, that worked out pretty well. When he said, have the crowd sit down in companies of 50 and 100, that worked like a charm. When Jesus says, gather up all of the leftovers, and they obeyed, they all filled a basket. But this time, when Jesus told them to do something, it didn't turn out so well. And I can picture those guys out there rowing in this peaceful scene, heading off to Capernaum, and they are all abuzz over what had just happened that day. Maybe they're even munching on some leftover fish and bread. And then the wind starts blowing. 
and the waves start crashing, and suddenly they are thinking, what are we doing out here? Whose idea was this anyway? Didn't Jesus tell us to come out here? Why would he do that? Wait a minute, where is Jesus anyway? Why didn't he come with us? What is going on? And you can imagine the questions. And you can imagine the questions because we ask them ourselves. See, sometimes when we obey Christ, things go rather smoothly. Sometimes he multiplies the loaves and fishes. Sometimes he allows the conversation with your lost loved one to go really well. Your relationship with your spouse is awesome. The doctor says you're good for another six months. The boss says, here's your bonus. CRA says, oops, we took too much this year. Here's some money back. Your friends at school accept you. Your kids respond to your correction. Everything in the house is in working order. And we whistle along the way. There's joy in serving Jesus. But other times you're doing the exact same things in obedience to Christ and things go terribly wrong. He puts you out in a boat alone and sends you into a perilous storm. The person to whom you are witnessing totally blows off what you say. Your spouse is just plain crotchety and there's nothing you can do to remedy the situation. The doctor says, I'm sorry, I've got bad news. The boss says, we need to downsize. CRA says, we haven't taken enough. People at school mock you to your face and behind your back. Your kids won't listen to you. There doesn't seem to be one thing in the house that is working. And even though we know we should, suddenly we don't feel very joyful. And perhaps there are those of you even listening to this message this morning, and you are exuberant because God's been doing some wonderful things in your life. Seems, things seem to be moving so smoothly for you, and it's just natural for you to rejoice. But maybe there are those of you who, as we even sang those songs just a moment ago, you struggled to sing along because you're struggling even to believe what those songs are talking about because you're hurting terribly. Maybe your boat has flipped upside down. This story teaches us a bit about expectations. It teaches us to expect that sometimes Jesus deliberately sends his followers out into a storm. The Jesus that so graciously sends fish and bread to us and sunshine and laughter is the same Jesus that also sends us into thunder and lightning and grief and pain. And we naturally are chipper and quick to offer him praise when the sea of life is smooth as we should, but we need to labor to be aware and to remind each other that Jesus is just as sovereign in our storms as he is in our sunshine. He is the same Jesus in our pleasure as he is in our pain. And sometimes God has lessons for us to learn about himself that we can only learn by going through disappointing times. And when we face trials, it is not necessarily because we have done wrongly, but it may very well be because we have done rightly. The disciples got into this mess not because they wanted to or because they did something wrong. They got into this mess because they obeyed Jesus. And sometimes the going gets tough and we start to wonder, am I doing something wrong? Why does everything blow up in my face? And it's not a bad question to ask. We ought always to see if perhaps God is chastising us or if in some way we are walking foolishly and he's seeking to right our path. But sometimes things do go wrong even when we are doing right. Don't get locked into thinking that serving Christ will always lead us down paths of ease. Sometimes following Christ means following him to the very valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes it's Jesus himself that sends us into the storm, but he never leaves us there. Notice secondly, I want you to see that Jesus sees his followers in the storm. After sending the disciples down to the sea, Jesus dismissed the multitudes and he ascended up into the mountain alone to pray to his Father. And what comes next in verse 17 is one of those little commentaries that John often gives us in his gospel as an eyewitness. At the end of verse 17 it says, And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. John was in that boat. <laughs> And he remembers how pitch black it was that night. Matthew and Mark say that it was in the fourth watch of the night. That is somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. And John remembers all of that. And even more, he remembers that Jesus was not yet with them. 
But he also vividly remembers this. In verse 18 it says, And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. This word arose is most used in the New Testament to describe a person waking up from sleep. The picture is that when the disciples first launched out, the sea was perfectly still, but then quite suddenly it came alive. The Sea of Galilee lies about 600 feet below sea level. And what often happens is that cool air from the southeast rushes in suddenly and collides with the warm, moist air hovering over the sea, and it turns very quickly into a violent squall. And that's exactly what happened. What do the disciples do? Well, what would you do? Wouldn't you just grab the oars and start paddling for dear life? Well, verse 19 says, So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs. Now, Mark says that they were actually toiling in rowing. They were giving as best as they could, and it says that they had rowed five or twenty or thirty furlongs. Now, that means very little to you or me in our context, so let me translate. A furlong is an old English form of measurement. The Greek word behind it is the word stadion. A stadion is 606 feet roughly. So if the disciples were 25 or 30 stadia out in the sea, can you do the math? They're a long way out. Somewhere between three to three and a half miles out. Matthew and Mark just say more generally that they were in the middle of the sea. Guess how wide the Sea of Galilee is? Six to seven miles. John's got it all measured out in stadia. Matthew and Mark just say that they were in the middle, but either way, they're all spot on. The disciples were a long way from shore, and their frantic rowing was only getting them farther into trouble. They were now as far from help as they could get dead center of the sea. Even worse, they were about as far from Jesus as they could get. Listen to what Mark says in Mark 6 and verse 47. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he, Jesus, was alone on the land. And get this. Jesus, it says, Mark 6, 47, saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. You say, wait a minute. I thought it was dark. I thought it was stormy. I thought they were like, three miles out into the center of the sea. And I thought Jesus was back on the shore. How could Jesus see the disciples? Now, if you have no faith, you might say, as some do, that the disciples were just rowing really close to the northern coast of the sea, and Jesus was running alongside the shore, keeping an eye on them. But if God has given you the ability to see with childlike faith the Bible you know without a doubt that this is Jesus looking through the darkness and through the storm, and he sees them perfectly because Jesus is omniscient. He sees everything. He is not limited in his sight by the darkness like we are. He is not limited in what he sees by the storm. He sees and knows everything that his followers are enduring. But even more, <clears throat> but even, even more, he is... He is, this is an absolute miracle that Jesus is able to see them through the darkness in the middle of the sea. Some of you may be weather watchers, and you like to keep track of whether it's going to rain or whether it's going to be dry, and in the winter you want to know if there's going to be snow coming or if there is not. But we also like to know about the visibility as we go out in a storm. If we have to go out in a rainstorm or in a snowstorm or whatever it happens to be, we often look to see what the visibility will be. And we need to know that because we know we're going to be in big trouble if the storm is going to keep us from seeing where we are going. Listen, that kind of thing doesn't apply to Jesus. He can be up on a mountain in prayer to his father in the pitch blackness and still see with perfect vision what is going on miles away below sea level in the middle of that sea. And friends, let me assure you that he sees you too. You are never out of his sight. And yes, he may send you into the storm from time to time, but he will never send you to a place where he can't see you. But that's not all. Jesus sends his followers into the storm he sees his followers in the storm, but thirdly, he seeks his followers in the storm. 
Again, verse 19, when they had rowed five, 20, or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea. Jesus saw them in the storm when they didn't see him. And in his compassion, he goes out to them in the middle of that storm, and now they see him. And I've got to show you this a minute. If you go back a few pages in your Bible there to John chapter 1 and verse 14, John has something that he wants you to see here. He introduced his gospel with this testimony in John 1 and verse 14 when he says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That term beheld in John 1 and verse 14 is the same word that we just read in chapter 6, the word see. That moment when the disciples beheld Jesus in that stormy night was one of those moments when they beheld the very glory of God. And when you understand that, you understand their response. Back in chapter 6 and verse 19, it says, when Jesus, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. Can you imagine this scene? Imagine. Here in this middle of the darkness, in this wild scene of high winds and turbulent waters, a man starts walking towards the disciples on the surface of those waters, just as if he's walking on a sidewalk. It's an unbelievable scene. Jesus is not teetering, trying to keep his balance as he's walking out there. He's just walking as if there's no storm at all. And he gets closer and closer. And once he gets up by the boat, they are in absolute terror. You say, why are they scared? I mean, weren't they tough old fishermen who are used to handling storms like this? Weren't they Jesus' disciples? Wouldn't this be a refreshing sight to them to see Jesus in a storm? Well, John doesn't tell us why they are scared. But Matthew and Mark both say that they were afraid because they actually thought that they were seeing a ghost. I mean, this didn't happen every day. You can say all you want about these guys. Maybe they should have known Jesus when they saw him. Maybe they should have even remembered that earlier time when Matthew 8 records for us that the disciples were caught in a storm and Jesus was peacefully sleeping at the bottom of the boat and they went down to wake him, hollering, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And Jesus arose and said, O ye of little faith, and he calms that raging sea. And they marveled at this time, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the seas obey him? Maybe they should have remembered that. More recently, you might think, didn't they just see Jesus feed the 5,000 men a few hours ago? Have they so quickly forgotten? In fact, Mark references that very thing and says that they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Sure, maybe they shouldn't have responded that way. But what would, what would you be doing? And what would you be thinking? And what would you be recognizing at that point? These guys were about to die, and they knew it. They had one thing on their mind, and that was survival. They're not recounting the events of months past or even the day before. They just want to live. And they were not just watching over the side of the boat, waiting for Jesus to come and save them. They were rowing feverishly. And this is what we do. We get, when we are out in the storm, we hustle and we react and we do everything that we can to get out of the storm, and well, we should. But sometimes in the storm, we fail to remember that Jesus sees and knows. We forget those things that he has done for us in the past, and we forget that he is seeking us, and we don't expect him to come, and when he does come, we're surprised. And no matter how many times Jesus has sought us in the past, our hearts are hardened, and we don't even recognize him. Is this a ghost? (laughs) Mark 6 and verse 48 adds an interesting detail and says that Jesus would have passed by them. Interesting. So he wasn't walking towards them. He was just walking alongside the boat. Perhaps he was doing so to see if they would recognize him and cry out and beg him for help to realize that they were at the end of the rope and they needed him. And the other accounts do indeed imply that they actually did cry out as he passed by. And Jesus responds to their fearful cries in verse 20, and he says, It is I, be not afraid. Jesus sends his followers into the storm. 
He sees his followers in the storm. He seeks us in the storm. But fourthly, Jesus speaks to his followers in the storm. The verb saith is a word that is given in a continual tense. And the idea is that he probably had to tell them a bunch of times, calm down, fellas, it's me. Take a deep breath, it's Jesus here. It's really me. Stop screaming. I'm not a ghost. If this is Jesus... And this phrase, it is I, is loaded with meaning. It is simply in the Greek, I am. Be not afraid. All over the Gospel of John, Jesus uses this title to describe himself, I am. This is the name of Yahweh. This is the name that God used to identify himself to Moses, the the name that God desired Moses to use to refer to him to the people of Israel before the Exodus. Tell them that I am sent you. And Jesus repeatedly owns that title, claiming without a doubt that he is God. And he comes to his followers in the storm, and he speaks to them these words of peace. And what sounded like in the first century was the audible, what it sounded like in the first century was the audible voice of Jesus. But today Jesus speaks to us in our storms through the written words of the scriptures. And he says to us, don't be afraid. It is I. I am. Just listen to me. Hear me. And folks, when the I am is standing beside you in the storm speaking to you, there's no more need to fear. And it's at this point, of course, that Matthew tells us that Peter does something, right? Lord, if it really is you, tell me to come. And you might be wondering, well, who else would it be, Peter? (laughs) But Jesus is patient, and he beckons him to come, and Peter comes. And he sees the waves again, and he sinks. But Jesus speaks to him very personally. Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And that's an entirely other message. But all John tells us here is this in closing. Verse 21, then they willingly received him into the ship. Of course they did. Jesus sends his followers into the storm. He sees his followers into the storm. He seeks them in the storm, and he speaks words of comfort to them in the storm. But finally, Jesus saves his followers from the storm. John doesn't state the obvious, but Matthew and Mark both say that as soon as Jesus entered into the ship, the wind ceased. Are you in a storm today? Can I encourage you with this? The storm does not last forever. The end is coming. The reason Jesus sends us into a storm is that we might experience salvation so that we might ultimately know who he is. Matthew says that after Jesus did this, the the disciples worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Mark adds that they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. And folks, when Jesus saves you and restores you in your trial, this is what you do. You give him glory, you praise him, and you testify about him. And don't miss the final part of the miracle at the end of verse 21. It says, immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. You say, what? I thought they were about three miles offshore. They were. But immediately, Jesus put them on shore in Capernaum. Absolutely amazing. Folks, Christ has appointed you to a destination, and he has seen fit that even though you will go through trials, he will walk with you through those trials, through those storms, but there is a day that is coming when you will ultimately be delivered from all of your trials, and you will be with Christ forever in glory. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as you face the storms into which Jesus sends you, Let me encourage you that he will always see you, that he sees you now even as you go through difficulty, and that he is seeking you, seeking to show himself to you, seeking to be right with you, and that as you draw near to him, he will draw near to you, and as you cry out to him, he will certainly come to you. And he promises to speak to you words of comfort and assurance, but ultimately he promises to save you. And he will continue to do these things until he will ultimately save you when you arrive at your heavenly destination. So don't be afraid. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word.
Thank you for all who have taken part and heard it here this morning. I do ask, Lord, that whatever struggles that folks may be facing, that you will help them to be able to understand that Jesus is with them, that Jesus is near to them, calling them to himself. He is the one who is able to give peace in the midst of the storm, but ultimately the one who will save from all of the storms, troubles, trials, even sin and eternal damnation. Jesus is by nature a Savior. And I pray, Lord, that we will learn to see Christ for who he truly is and that we will be able to bear the easy yoke that he gives to us. And I pray, Lord, that you will just grant encouragement to each one through the word as it's been communicated. And I pray that you will just help us to be serve you throughout this week in a way that would bring honor and pleasure to the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Why don't we sing one last song uh, together that really uh, reinforces uh, what we've just looked at here in John chapter 6. The song Anywhere with Jesus, or several verses to this song, we'll just sing two of them here, the song Anywhere with Jesus. Join me as I sing this. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below, anywhere without him, dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear. can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep. When the darkening shadows round about me creep, knowing I shall wake and never more to roam. Anywhere with Jesus will be home sweet home. Anywhere cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. I hope that is your testimony uh, this morning. Um, maybe there's some questions have arisen as a result of the time that we've had here together, or maybe you're just at home and you need some prayer and maybe you haven't reached out. Uh, to one of the pastors here or somebody involved in the church here, uh, feel free to do that. We'd love to be able to pray with you and to encourage you further. And if you don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we'd also love to be able to share with you further how you might uh, know Christ as your Savior and be absolutely sure that he is with you all through this life and even throughout eternity. And uh, so reach out uh, to the church office there, send an email if there's any way that we can be a help and encouragement to you. Again, after we sign off here in just a moment, uh, there will be uh, several slides that will be shown just giving announcements for things that are upcoming on the church calendar. And again, if you're particularly attached to the ministry here, you'll want to stick around and be a part of that and uh, watch that to see what's coming and transfer some things onto your own calendar. And, uh, but if you're not, uh, feel free to just go ahead and uh, dismiss yourself at this point. But thank you again for joining us on this Lord's Day. Trust you have a great rest of the day. There will be no 6 o'clock uh, service that will be streamed uh, tonight. Again, our church families out enjoying a day out at camp, having several services out there. And uh, so we apologize for the inconvenience, but there will be no 6 o'clock service. So we'll look forward to seeing you next time as our next stream will be Wednesday night at uh, 7 o'clock. And hope you can join us then if you can't get here in person. God bless. Thank you.